All right, everybody. Who's ready for announcements? Yes! Announcements are my favorite time ever. Just kidding. All right. Fine Arts and Convention, 17th and 18th. This is very important. If you are not in the Fine Arts video, if you want to simply go to convention, you have to give us a definite by April 14th. May 2nd, we're having a huge Ford's flea market and tag sale. So that's gonna be like a huge, huge flea market and tag sale. So basically, all of you guys, we need you guys to bring some nice junk, not like junk that like is junk, but like nice junk that is actually somebody would actually want. So we're gonna need you guys to donate it so we can sell it to raise money for you guys. And then we're also gonna have the option, people can purchase like a vendor slot. So they will purchase it for $100 and then they can bring their own stuff. And then another important announcement for those in the human video, which by the way, is awesome for those who are in it. It's seriously gonna be amazing on Sunday. You guys have another practice on Saturday. So it's at one to three, right? All right, so come on with your game faces. No cell phones, because we gotta be serious. Just kidding, you can bring your cell phones. You guys, all, <laughs> all of you in the back row of the me. <laughs> Randy had the death look. All right, so that's it for announcements. God, we're just so grateful, Lord, that we serve a God who multiplies. And I know that you know we're only like you know 20 people here. We don't have much money, but we thank you, God, that you have the ability to take the little that we can give, and you can turn it into much, God. As we just gather together with all these other youth groups around uh, New England and Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Connecticut, God, I pray that as we give sacrificially, Lord, would you take the little that we have and would you make it much so that this missionary and his family, as they go to do the work that you've called them to do, that they could be blessed with a car, something that without it would be extremely difficult to do what you're called them to do. So, Father, I pray that you would bless these students and I pray that you would just speak to their hearts right now, God, and encourage them and challenge them to give to your kingdom and to watch you do amazing things with the little that we have. So God, we thank you so much, in Jesus' name, amen. So the offering bucket's gonna come around quick. You guys can be seated until it has hit you. But uh, one thing that we've been doing that I've really been liking is during worship, we've been kind of spreading out a little bit, getting into our own little section. I mean, literally, you can go anywhere you want. I wanna encourage you guys, after the bucket goes around, I want you to stand, but I also want you to spread around the room. Why are we doing that? Because I want you to get alone with God for a minute. While we worship Him, I want to just take away all the distractions. Take away all the, the pressure of, oh, I don't want to sing loud because my friend is standing next to me. Let's just focus and let's just get our attention on Jesus. And let's just let's just worship him the way that he deserves to be glorified. So you guys can spread out anywhere you want. You can come to the front. We can do whatever you want. But the intention is just take away all the distractions. And let's just worship Jesus. All right, let's do it.
Shall we make? 
in our hearts to want more of you. God, I remember being a teenager. God, I remember wishing that I had people around me who could encourage me to go on the same journey that I was. But I was alone, Lord. But I thank you that, God, these teenagers can join together as a forged family. And together, God, they can cry out that they want more of you. That they want to go on a journey of experiencing more of your presence in their lives. Because when we're in your presence, Jesus, we're transformed. God, would you just set a fire in our hearts, Jesus? God, make us so passionate for you, for your word, and for your people that, God, we're just going to go out and change the world. But, God, the change starts in us. Would you put a change, put a fire in our hearts, Jesus? God, we need more of you students right now. Why don't we just lift our hands and just cry to Jesus? God, I may not even want more of you, but would you help me to want more of you? Some of us, if we'll be honest, would just say, you know what, God, sometimes... I'm here on Tuesday nights and I'm not really feeling it. Sometimes I'm here on Tuesday nights and just kind of here because I'm just doing the same old thing my parents made me do. Maybe you're here, you don't even really want more. But let's just cry out to Jesus together. Sometimes we've all been there. Just be like, you know what, God? Tonight I'm not feeling it, but I want to push through. And I want you to give me more of a desire for you. Because, God, at the end of the day, no matter how I feel, you are worthy of my praise. The way I feel today doesn't undo what you did on the cross. You still did it, and therefore you're still worthy of praise. And therefore, God, I'm going to choose today to say that I want more of you. So, God, would you come now, Jesus? Just set a fire in our hearts. God, we just need more of you. The forge, God, we're going places. But, God, if we leave you behind, we're never going to go anywhere. So, God, just set a fire in our hearts. A fire that we can't contain can't control, a fire that's so large and so burning, Lord, that in two, three months, in a short period from now, God, this youth group, because of our fire, is completely different. It's twice as big. It's twice as many people here, and we're all twice as in love with you as we are right now. God, set a fire in our hearts, Jesus, so that we can go out and set a fire in other people's hearts for you, by helping people find their purpose, helping people find their destiny. And their destiny starts by knowing Jesus. God, would you transform us? Would you change us? And most of all, God, would you just help us? We're relying on you today, God. We acknowledge that without you, we ain't going to go nowhere. We're not going to accomplish nothing. But with you, Father, we can change the world. So God, we just thank you. And we thank you for everything that you've done for us so far. And what you're going to continue to do, Jesus. But we do acknowledge, Lord. That you, if, if you never did another thing for us, that you would still be worthy because you've already done enough. So God, we just want to say thank you and that we love you. In Jesus' name. You guys can see it. So I'm going to try something a little different today. Boom, a little hot right now. Feedback in, feedback in. Actually, I'm going to put that over here. Okay. Can you mind grabbing that stool for me? I want to try using this little table because I've never done that before. So I'm going to try it today. And let's see what happens. So I did something cool this past weekend that I've never done before. I went to the Pinewood Derby. Anyone know what the Pinewood Derby is? I think most of you know what the Pinewood Derby is. Does anyone not know what the Pinewood Derby is? Anyone? You were there. Come on, dude. But pretty much what the Pinewood Derby is, it's, it's a Royal Ranger thing. Most of you know this, but I'll explain to those who don't. There's a few of you. And they take these little cars that look like this. Derby cars. Derby cars. They call them derby cars? I don't know. This is my first derby car ever. It's pine. It's pine? It's pinewood? I don't know what this is made of. To me, it's a block of wood. <laughs> I don't know what this is made of. But anyway, so they have a bunch of kids. And it was, it was a section thing they had here. And this whole, they changed this whole room. They had a huge race car track. Did anyone, who was actually here? You know, so, like half of you were here. You were here too. Dude. I was talking to you, bro. This guy. Yeah, this guy. <laughs> so they start out with these cars. And these kids, through a long process, they take these cars, which right now look like nothing special. They're just a block of wood, which it looks like they took a drill bit and put two holes in it. it looks pretty good to you. Would you race this? I'm better. I'm better. Would you race this? He'd lose. He'd lose big time. So, even though I had never been to this to this Pinewood Derby, they asked me to do a little devotional. 
and I wanted to tag team off what I did at the Pioneer Derby, and I wanted to bring it back today, but I wanted to elaborate on it. So pretty much what it is, like I said, they take this little pine wood, which is not impressive, just a rectangular block of wood, but through a long process of transformation, they take some drill bits, let me fix this here, they take some drill bits, they take some sandpaper, they, they cut some edges around it, and then it's, you know, it's this weird object of a block, and they take some sandpaper, and through a long process, I mean, these kids were here every Wednesday night for like a month or something. Was it like maybe even over a month or something like that? Hours at a time. And it took a long time to work on these cars, but then when they were finally done, we had some really cool cars that looked like this. This is a bathtub. This one's sweet. It was a genie that was in here? There was something in here. I don't know what it was. But this is sweet because people managed to take this. Yeah, this is old. This, this, but this is my favorite one. That's why I chose this one. But people managed to take this block of wood, which really looks like nothing in its original state. <laughs> That's, I think it's just, I think it's just styrofoam that they painted on. That's hilarious. They've got a little shower head and everything. But I was absolutely amazed that they could take this, which is just a block of wood that looks like nothing in its original state, but through transformation and process, a long process, took a while, that they can make it look like this. I thought it was so cool. And I came here, I came here on Saturday, and it was obviously more than one car. This car wasn't actually even here. This is an old car. They had tons of cars. They had, I don't know what this is, but they had a bunch of different, this is a really, this is a really cool one too. This one's sweet. It is. It, it's not all made of wood. They added like a cap to it, but this one's sweet. But still, this one is awesome because this, here goes the bathtub. This started like this. World of a difference. But the thing is, it didn't just get there. It didn't just wake up one day and it was like a crazy, awesome, great work of art. It took the kids who crafted their vehicles, took them like almost a month of hours of cutting, of sanding, of painting, and it had to go through a long transformation before it could become this great work of art. And as I was just asking Commander Scott, Tyler, and Ashley's dad, and actually Elizabeth's dad now too, she's here, hey, we got a new person, hey, look at that. When he began to explain to me this process, because when he asked me to speak, I was like, yeah, I'll speak, but I don't know what the heck Pound Derby is, so <laughs> can I get a little four and one on it? And uh, so he began to explain this to me, and as he was talking to me, I just began to realize, I was like, wow, isn't that so crazy how that resembles us? And when we're babies, we're born, you know, born to this world, we look just like this. Ain't nothing special about us, we may be cute, but on, 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 on our own, we ain't accomplish nothing because we're babies, we're dependent on our parents, we don't know anything, pretty much just a rectangular block of wood. But through process and transformation, we get a little bit older, we start wearing different clothes, we start learning stuff. And also similar, when we first get saved, when we're reborn, right? We don't know much about the Bible. We don't know much about God. We don't know much. We don't have, we're not equipped with much on how we can be changed and transformed to do great things in our lives. And I just begin to think, isn't it so funny how if we'll put ourselves in God's hands and allow him to change and transform us, take us on a process, then eventually we can be forged into greatness. God sometimes might take you to the bandsaw, like these pieces of wood, and cut out some of your bad habits, but then what he's doing for that? takes the sandpaper, begins to smooth out your rough edges. Sometimes God wants to take you through a process, not to hurt you, not to harm you, but because one day he knows if you'll allow him to, you can reach a place where you'll be a great people work of art. And that's when you can be greatness. That's when you can do amazing things in your lives. And there's a, there's a passage of scripture that I want to read to you, Jeremiah 18, 1, 6, that is very similar to what we're talking about today. It reads like this. The word that came down to Jeremiah from the Lord Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will give you my message. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working at his wheel. And the, and the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, so he reworked it into another vessel, shaping it as it seemed best to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me, Can I not do with you as this potter has done, declares the Lord. Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. So here we got this guy named Jeremiah great guy. He's actually a prophet. What a prophet is, is pretty much, so back in the Old Testament before Jesus died and restored that relationship back to God, right? Because we were all distant from God, couldn't have a connection with him. The whole, we didn't have the Holy Spirit in our hearts. So the whole, God couldn't just like talk to people. So he would choose prophets. Every, these random people, Jeremiah being one of them, God would speak to that person and then the prophet would go tell everyone what God said. So this is Jeremiah and one day Jeremiah is just chilling and God begins to speak to him. 
The first thing he says is, go arise and go down to the potter's house. But little did Jeremiah know that God was about to take him on a journey of achieving and being forged into greatness. He was about to give him the steps of what it's going to take to reach greatness. And the first thing that I taught Jeremiah was in order to achieve greatness, he must be in the presence of greatness. I love, uh, the Bible is so creative sometimes. And I love what it says in the first verse. It says, the word that came down to Jeremiah from the Lord, the first few words, it says, arise and go down. It's like, God, are you aware that that's like an oxymoron? You want me to get up, and then you want me to go back down? And, it's, and I just, I would begin to read that scripture. I was like, God, why would you put an oxymoron in the Bible? I was like, God, why would you do that? And then I kind of begin to realize, maybe that God wants us to be the generation of people who will arise and say, you know what, God? I'm going to stand up, and I'm going to allow myself to go down. I'm going to allow myself to get on my knees and submit my life into your hands so that you can transform me and change me so that one day I can achieve greatness. So that one day, God, I can be so transformed by your goodness, so transformed by your power, that, God, I'm not going to look like this anymore when you're done with me. God, I'm going to be a great work of art. God, I'm going to be something that people have never seen. I'm going to be something that changes the world. But first, if I want to do that, I've got to be in your presence. I've got to allow myself to get into your hand. That's what he's talking about, the clay. We put it into your hand, and then I can change you. I can transform you. But we've got to be in his presence. That's why prayer is so important. Because we've got to spend time with God. If you want God to tell you what you want him to do, what he wants you to do with your life, you've got to talk to him. It's pretty, it's pretty plain and simple. But see, I, I love where it says here, where he says, Arise, go down to the potter's house, and there, then I will give you my message. There's so many of us who look at all these great people in the world, and they're achieving, they're achieving greatness. They're doing all these awesome things. And they're like, well, cool, man. That's great for you. I'm, great that, I'm glad that God's using you. I'm glad that God spoke to you, and now you know what you're supposed to do with your life. But God hasn't spoken to me what, I wanted, what, what he's going to do in my life. I don't know what God wants to do in my life. I wish God would use me to achieve greatness. But if you're here wondering God, what God wants to do with you, and you're kind of frustrated that God hasn't spoken to you, then I would ask you, have you been in his presence? You're trying to achieve greatness. So you want the message, but you don't want to be in his presence. You want to just skip the whole process. You want to be like, okay, God, let's just do, let's just do this thing. Let's just let's skip the whole transformation. I just want to be like this right away, and then let's just do what you want to do. But God, you're not speaking to me. Well, God, a lot of times, doesn't speak to us if we don't have a conversation. If we want to hear the message, we've got to be in his presence. He says, I'm going to take you on a journey. He's talking to Jeremiah. I'm going to teach you how to achieve greatness. But what's the first thing he says? You gotta go to the potter's house. You gotta go to where the potter is. The potter is God in the story who takes the clay and transforms it and shapes it into amazing people. You guys have such potential. I know you guys are young, some of you were 12, 13, but you, that's like the prime age where people still believe they can change the world. That's the cool thing about teenagers. You guys are still crazy enough to believe that you can do cool stuff. Because <laughs> when you start getting older, you're like, I'm like 40, I'm, I'm useless by now. But when you're young, you still believe, and even the 40 year olds should still believe, but you guys still believe, I got my whole life ahead of me, and I want to achieve greatness. It's at your age where you guys have dreams, you guys have ambitions, you guys have, you know what? You know what? I don't want to just be someone who just lives a whole life and then dies and no one remembers. I want to do something. At least I hope you think this way. I want to be someone that someone remembers. I want to be someone that when I'm gone, people show up at my funeral and go, wow, man, he made a difference in my life. I want to be that kind of person. I don't want to just be the kind of Christian that avoids doing bad stuff. I want to be the kind of Christian that does good. I don't want to just avoid bad. I want to do good. Because I want to walk down the street, and I want to make people a difference in people's lives. I don't want to just live my life and just get it over with. No, but while I'm here, I want people to, to look at me as, well, man, that's, that's a guy who brings inspiration to me. That's a guy who, do, who does something. Even though sometimes it may be inconvenient for him, he goes out of his way to help people. I want people to speak highly of me so that I can be someone who's inspiration, so I can give all the glory to God, so I can do amazing things. And I hope that's what you're like. I hope you're not here thinking, oh, well, I'm just, I'm just like 14. What the heck am I going to do in life? No. You guys are absolutely amazing. You guys are young. You guys are vibrant. You guys have the potential to change the world. I don't look at you. Me, me, your parents, us youth leaders, we don't look at you guys and just say, oh, teenager, block wood, hang in another, nothing special. No. This is where we all begin, where we look at you, and not as a boring block of wood, but as future greatness. We look at you guys and be like, yeah, one day, this is going to be this is gonna be him. One day, this is going to be Jordan. One day, this is going to be Ashley. Kyle, yeah, one day, it's going to be you. He's going to pick me. He's going to pick me. Yeah, I'm picking you. 
And the, and, and the thing that I love about God's idea of greatness is sometimes, like, we think, you know, whatever your, your certain area of talent or gift that God's given you that you want to excel at, uh, let me pick a random person. Who draws? Ashley, you draw, right? So you might think, oh, I want to achieve greatness. So if I want to be a, take this guy. So if I want to be a great artist, then I've got to draw, and I spoke about this uh, like a month ago. If I want to be a great artist, then I've got to draw like this guy. I've got to draw just like this guy. If I want to achieve greatness, I've got to achieve his kind of greatness. But God says, no, I can make all sorts of greatness. Greatness can come in all different shapes, can come in all different colors. This might be, this might be your greatness, actually. But say, Tyler, you don't really draw. Well, Shaylin, you draw that stuff. This might be your greatness. They might look completely different, but they're still great. They're a little bit different. Maybe I'm a, this is my greatness, because I like this car. This is my greatness right here. I'm logging this one. The bathtub? No, no, you can have that one. I want, I want that one. This is a cool one, too. This one's a couch potato. This one's hilarious. I love this one. It's literally a couch, and there's a potato on it, and there's even a pillow stuffed with It's like stuffed with sand. It's kind of cool. These are wicked creative. But to me, this is creativity. To me, this is greatness that God has given us. To me, I'm blown away when I look at its beginning state, but I see this. But the thing that's even more beautiful is that every single one of these is really cool, and there's some really awesome ones downstairs that I didn't have enough hands to bring all of them. They're all great, but they're all different. <coughs> they're all great in their own different ways. But if we want to achieve greatness, if you want to excel at the gifts that you, that you want to be better at, you've got to be in the presence of greatness. And, and, and I want to get a little more practical. I don't mean just God. If you want to get better at worship leading, Shelby, I would encourage you. Follow some really great worship leaders. Be in their presence. If you meet them in person, ask them as many questions as you can. One thing Amanda does all the time, she's on YouTube watching other worship leaders. Not because she wants to be just like them, but she wants to learn from them. She wants to do things that they do so she can learn and then put them into her own personality, her own gifts, and her own introverted quietness. And she wants to get better. Whatever your guys' gifts are, I would encourage you, get into the presence of those great people. Whether you meet them in real life or you just watch them on YouTube. I watch YouTube like it's my job. I wish I got paid to do it. I'd make a lot of money because I watch a lot of YouTube. But if you, guys, if you guys want to get better at a video game, watch a guy who's better than you at that video game. That's what I do the same thing. If you want to achieve greatness, you've got to be in the presence of greatness. Both people and God. Most importantly, God, because watching other people will definitely benefit you. God wants you to spend your time wisely learning, to give, uh, using, being a good steward of the gift that he's given you, excelling to the best of your, uh, uh, your abilities. But at the end of the day, God's anointing will trump any other gift that you can learn from someone. If you want to achieve greatness in whatever your, whatever your skill is, then you've got to be in the greatness. You've got to be in the presence of greatness. Second thing I want to tell you, if you want to achieve greatness, you must first realize that we are not greatness. Yes, I believe that God can do amazing things in your life, and I believe that he can transform you. But at the end of the day, we are not the great ones. In verse 4, I love what it says in verse 4. Let me scroll down really quick. And the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand. And he reworked it into another vessel, shaping it as it seemed best to him. I love that. I love the Bible. Again, it's just so creative. It's so fun. When you read that verse and he's talking about how the potter was, was you know, messing around with some clay. Does everyone know what a potter is, by the way? Everyone, yeah, everyone knows what a potter is. The potter is playing with some clay, and the clay is spoiled, right? And now, in the original text, what it actually means is that it's like ruined. It's, if, if by itself, if he doesn't work on it, it's useless. That's what, that's what it actually means. But I just think it's so funny, the word that he uses. It was spoiled. Because so many times, that's what we are. That's what I am. I want things to work out my way. I want things to go according to my plans. just want things to be easy. And I want things to go the way that I am. Because I don't want to go through the process. I want to jump from A to B. It's exactly what I want to do. Because I don't want my life... At time, like, I'll be honest, at times, I don't really want to submit to the Lord because I want things to go my way. Let's just be real. It's hard giving your life, surrendering, making him not just Savior, but Lord, which, which means that he has control, which means that he has permission because he's the boss, right? He's the master who created the whole hand. I, I just love it because, like, seven-year-olds, right, they took this, but they had the absolute right to make this look like whatever they wanted when they were done because this was their creation. They are the master, they are the crafter of this piece. If they want to paint it blue, they can paint it blue. If they want to make it a bathtub, put a couch potato on it, 
They have the absolute right to do so. Why? Because it's theirs. This is their creation. Therefore, the creator has the right to do whatever he wants with it. You know, I love what the Bible says. That we're no longer our own, but we were bought with a price. I just love that. I think of, I just think of it. I, I like close my eyes and picture it, and I picture myself just like on a shelf at a supermarket, and Jesus just comes and purchases me. But see, the thing is about me is that I wasn't just on sale. I was on the clearance rack because nobody wanted me because I was full of sin and dirtiness and all these bad stuff. But Jesus came along and said, no, I'm not just going to buy you. I'm going to pay the highest price for you. Yeah, you know what? I could pay a quarter for you because no one else wants you anyway. But no, I'm going to give my blood. Jesus said, I'm going to give my life because I want to prove to you that I love you. We, we, we talked about this a few months ago, that God makes the rules and that he could have made the rule that the thing that needed to be spilt to purchase us could have been something easy. God made the rules. Yeah, there's that Bible verse. There's no remission for sins, forgiveness for sins without the shedding of blood. That's the standard. But who made that standard? God made that standard. God could have said, ooh, you price tag, sheep. I'll kill the sheep and you'll be good to go. Ooh, price tag, give me five bucks and you'll get into heaven. He could have, he could have done that. He could have made whatever he wanted to. But he said, no, I want to make it my blood. I want to make the price tag the blood of Jesus. What's the highest possible price that I could think of? That's what I'm going to put up. Why? Because I believe that if I shed my blood, you'll know without a shadow of a doubt that I love you. God is the one who's greatness. He's the one who's worthy of praise, not us. We can do great things in his name, but at the end of the day, we're not greatness. I love what it says in, in John 15, 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. God's the tree, and we're just like the branches. He's the source, right? If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. So God says here, I'm the source. I'm the one who's going to allow you to achieve greatness. I am the branch. I am the tree. Yes, you may be the branches where the, the, the fruit and the nice pretty things actually come out of. You may be the one who actually has the ability to draw, sing, uh, do graphic design, play the bass. You may be the one who actually has the gift, but it came originally from the source. It says, if you remain in me, if, you, if, you'll be, if you'll continue to be in my hand and let me transform you, then there's nothing that's going to stop you. If you remain in me, then it says you'll bear much fruit. I want to change that. If you remain in me, then you can achieve greatness. But then it says, and there's a colon in there, but if you are apart from me, then you can do nothing. And now, some of you might think, well, I, I, you know, I know a lot, a lot, not a lot of non-Christian people who do some pretty cool things, and they don't, they're not part of Jesus' tree. They're not part of his mind. They're doing their own thing. They don't even like God. They're, they're atheists. They don't even believe in God. And I would agree with you 100%. But we'll never achieve greatness in the light of eternity. We'll never do anything that matters in heaven if we don't stay remained a part of God's tree. If we're not in his presence. If we wouldn't acknowledge that he is the great one. Yeah, you may do things that, that are great. But one day when God destroys the whole earth and builds a new one, is what we're going to do still matter? Or are the people up in heaven going to be coming up to us and saying, Hey Mark, man, appreciate what you did for me like whatever money years ago. Change my life. You're going to go to heaven and people are going to love to you. You know, Tyler and be like, man, dude, you probably don't remember me because you, you were, you know, just hanging out with a group of friends. But you just said something. You didn't even really think it was a big deal. But it changed my life. And I've never been the same ever since. And I remember you just want to say thank you. Or are you going to be the kind of people that you're just going to kind of, you kind of, kind of hope that God doesn't see you as you walk through the gates. I'm not really that great. Didn't really do much of it. But I'm just getting you by the skin of my teeth. Or are you going to be the one. Oh, the bathtub. Oh, or are you going to be the one. <laughs> where you're going to be the one who's going to be up in heaven and people are going to be coming to you. Like, can you imagine, like, Moses and, like, Abraham? Like, dude, I'm going to be like, you the man, bro. Like, if it wasn't for you, like, this book, Ten Commandments, like, Paul, man, if you didn't, like, do what you did, bro, if you didn't write two-thirds of the New Testament, like, the New Testament would be lame because it would be, like, not even there. Like, can you imagine, like, just, I mean, they're not going to get the glory, but, of course, like, we're going to give them thanks. I mean, I appreciate your sacrifice. I appreciate the great things that you did on earth. But imagine if they never did that. Like, what, what would the Bible look like? You know, we have all these great people in this book. But imagine if they never did anything. Like, we wouldn't be reading about them today. This book has such great people in it who decided to put their, to put their lives into the hands of the potter that 2,000 years ago we're still talking about them. That's the kind of person I want to be. If Jesus doesn't come back for another 2,000 years, which I highly doubt, but I don't know. No, no, nobody knows. Like, I would love it if people 2,000 years ago were remembering, wow, that guy changed. He shook the whole foundation of the world, not because he was great, but because he was attached to the one who is great. 
He was a part of the tree. He was a part of the vine. And he said, you know what, God ain't nothing really special about me. I'm not going to change the world. I can't do nothing. But if I will remain, if I will remain in you, then I can achieve greatness. But I'll tell you, God brings humility to those who are proud. You may be, you may be climbing the, the ladder of greatness, doing things on your own, but if you're trying to take the credit, I'll tell you, the stairs underneath your feet are going to fall really quick, and you're going to fall right down to the bottom. You can only achieve greatness if you first realize that we are not the ones who are great, but God's great. And he gets the credit, and he gets the glory, and he's the source He's the one who's going to give you the strength to be able to do it. He's the one who's going to teach you. He's the one who's going to give you the gifts. He's the one who's going to give you the talents. Mark, the only reason you can play bass is because God gave you, like you even said, it's all God, man. That's a, great, that's a great mentality, bro. The reason you can play bass, the reason 10 years from now you're going to be an even better bassist is because God gave you the gift. Because the one who is great is teaching you how to be great too. Because he wants you to be like him. And if you're going to be like Jesus, you're going to be pretty awesome because he's the man. <laughs> if you will engage yourself to becoming more like Jesus, Trust me, people are going to like you. You're going to be doing great things because if you're being like Jesus, that's all he knows how to do. Jesus knows how to change the world. Jesus knows how to lead worship. Jesus knows how to draw. Jesus knows everything that you do, Jesus did it first. And he taught you how to do it. He is the one who is great. The thing that I love about God is God doesn't just want you to come and be like, all right, I'm the boss. You're my servant. You're going to submit to me, and that's just the way it is. No, but God wants you to come into his arms. He wants you to come into his hands. And he wants you to pour blessing on you. But the blessing comes. So many times in the Bible, you read verses where you're like, oh, I'll do this. And then there's an if in the middle. I'll do this for you if you'll follow me, if you'll obey me. It says right here, if you're part of the tree, you're going to bear much fruit. But if you depart from me, if you leave, you'll have nothing to do. But I love that God wants to pour his blessings on us because we can trust God. It's difficult, friends, to put your life Give away yourself 100% to someone that is unfaithful. I wouldn't want to put my life into the hands of someone who can't be trusted. I wouldn't want to put my life into the hands of someone who's got bad intentions. But I love what it said a few verses ago. He shaped the clay to what he saw best. Because God's going to shape you and transform you with, his, with your best intentions in mind. God's going to shape you into something that he knows you would love being. I used to go to school for architecture before I put my hands in the, in the before I put my life in the potter's hands. I loved architecture. I was like, God, there's no way I'd do something better than this. But I said, you know what, God, I, I'm not in your hand. Let me put myself in your hand. Let me give you lordship over my life. He's like, I want you to be a pastor. And I was like, are you crazy? I never ever in a million years want to be a pastor. That's like the last thing I want to do. You want to go to architecture school? I love to draw. I love math. And I'm doing really good. I'm going to make a lot of money. Okay. <coughs> But then God said, no, I want to put you in my hand. But God didn't want to boss him around and force me to be a pastor. He knew that by being a pastor, I would look, I would look back five years ago and be like, wow, this is way better than being an architect. God, because you knew, you knew the desires of my heart. That's what I love. Psalm 37. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. What the heck is that? Two, two different things I take from the scripture. Now, one, God's going to give you the desires of your heart. One, the things that you love, the desires that you have, God gave you those desires. The fact that you like to lead worship, God gave you that desire. The fact that you like to draw, the fact that you play the bass, the fact that... Who, who, who does something that I haven't mentioned? What do you do? Yeah. You write. God gave you the desire to write. What do you do? Jeanette, I didn't know that. Okay, girl, what do you say? I didn't know that. All right. All these desires, these loves, these interests that you have, those are things that God gave you. But two, God will give you the desires of your heart. <clears throat> Same thing, different meaning. The things that you desire one day, I want to grow up and I want to, I want to be able to write blogs on the internet that are going to bless people. I want to be a writer. Whatever it is, one day I want to grow up and do this. If you will pray in accordance with God's will. God, what do you want? This is how I pray all the time. Lord, this is what I want. This, I'm going to tell you what I want. This is what I want, Lord. I would like to do this. I would like to have this thing. But then I say this. But if it's not your will, then don't give it to me. God, I want this, but you do whatever you want first because you're the boss. But God will give you the desires of your heart. If you want something, if you want to be something in life and it's in accordance with his will, then he'll give it to you. Because we are in the hands of someone that we can trust. We can, we can rest a little bit easier knowing that our lives 
who we are, we're being held in the hands of greatness. Because God is in control. God is over the whole earth. And you don't have to be afraid. Oh man, what a, what's life going to look like when I, when I, when I surrender 100% to God? What's life going to look like when I start, when I give up control to God? What's, what's that going to look like? You don't have to fear. Because he's got, like it said, he's going to shake you into what seems best for him. He says at the very end, are you not the clay in the potter's hands? And if he can shake that, then I can do the same with you. God wants to bring you guys to greatness. He wants to use you to change the world. I know I say that to you guys all the time. I'm a huge optimist. I don't know about you, but I'm going to change the world. I don't know if anyone's coming with me. <laughs> but I'm going to be something great. I'm not going to sit around. It's not because I'm a pastor. It's because I'm a Christian. And I have the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of me. I'm going to do something that's going to achieve greatness in my world. But here's the question that I want to ask you. If you want to achieve greatness, which I'm assuming everybody does. No one wants to be lame. No one sits down and go, you know what? I want to do my hardest to make sure I never do anything good in life. I want, I want, you know, I'm going to wake up every day and figure out how can I suck at life. I don't, think, I don't think people wake up and do that. But we're young. We all have aspirations. We all want to do something great in our world. But here's what I want to ask you. Are you willing to put yourself into the potter's hands? The greatness that you dream of, the greatness that you have huge hopes for, aspirations of, whatever they may be. You know, maybe you want to be a doctor one day. Maybe you want to be a lawyer. Maybe you just want to be a stay-at-home mom and you want to raise three children. Maybe you want to also homeschool your children. <laughs> like, hey, you know, whatever, whatever you want to do, if you want to achieve greatness, here's all I want to ask you. And Amanda, you can come play some, some nice piano for me. You want to raise five children. Are you crazy? What? Are you crazy? Are you crazy? <laughs> but I want to ask you something. You want to achieve greatness. I, I'm just assuming that that's a blanket statement. I'm assuming that everyone wants to achieve greatness. Because if you don't, then I don't know. I don't know what else to do. But here's what I want to tell you. Are you willing to put yourself into the hands of the potter? Are you willing to put yourself in God's hands. Yes, I know all of you are already a Christian. It's, it, this isn't a question of, do you want to accept Jesus in your heart? No, this is a question of, do you want to make God the Lord of your life? Do you want to allow Him to take you from something that's really not that special, from something that's really not that great? And do you want to allow God, through, through a process, I'm not going to wake up tomorrow and change the world, but through a process, through some cutting, of, some cutting out of maybe some bad habits, and maybe even adding a little bit to you. That's what, that's what I love about these two cards right here. Because they weren't just cut, they weren't just painted, but they were added to. Maybe you're here and maybe you're someone who's shy. And you're thinking, how am I ever going to tell my friends about Jesus? I'm so shy. Maybe just like these people who added a little bit extra to their art. Maybe God wants to add a little bit extra to you. Maybe you're shy and God wants to add a little bit of boldness to you. Maybe you're afraid and God wants to add a little bit of courage to your life. Maybe you are, you know, you're doing something, uh, maybe you're an artist, but you're not the greatest artist. Maybe God wants to add a little bit more skill, a little bit more anointing to your work, so that you can achieve greatness. But my fear is that some of us feel disqualified. We feel like, oh yeah, you know, I, I, may, I may be pretty, I may, I may be a car, I may look great, you know, I'm getting along the process. But if you put me in the race, I'm never going to be able to finish the finish line. I'm never going to cross that finish line because I've done this too much in my life too much sin in my life, too many mistakes that I've made, I've got, I've got too much going on, maybe, I'm, man, I'm only like 12, I'm totally disqualified from changing the world, I'm like 12 years old, I want to encourage you guys, your sin, your whatever it may be that you think is holding you back from achieving greatness, it's not, the only thing that's standing between you and greatness is yourself, it's the only thing, all you got to do is say yes, yes God, I'll go into the hands of the and I'll allow you at whatever pace you want, whatever shape you want to move me into, whatever, whatever you want to do, God, you have the freedom to do so because the Creator has the freedom and the right to do whatever He wants with the creation. God, I'll put myself in your hands because I want to go out. I want to change the world. I want to go out, but I want to do something different. Maybe you're here and you're thinking, man, I, I, I've made a lot of mistakes in my life. I can't cross the finish line because I've got, I've got a lot of sin. See, the thing is, you don't, have to, you don't have to worry about your sin keeping you from crossing the finish line. You don't have to worry about your sin. Because your sin for your sin, the cross was the finish line. Jesus said, I know that you're a sinner. I know you've made mistakes. But here's, here's what I'm drawing the line. At the cross. Sin's not going to get past this point. Because once you've accepted me, which all of you have, because I know personally that you're, you're Christians. 
Once you've reached this point, the sin's not going any further. You may struggle, you may have some problems you've got going on, but it's not gonna keep you from going further because at the cross, yes, the sin stopped, but then freedom started. All these good things that God wants to do to life after the cross is where they started. Freedom, anointing, gifts, purpose, destiny. After that point, after that finish line where sin stopped over there, that's, that's where things are going to change your life. But you've got to put yourself into the hands of the Father. You've got to say, God, you know what? Sorry about me. I'm not even the one who's great. You're the one who's great. But if I will follow after you, if I will become more like you, if you're going to become more like greatness, you're going to become more like greatness. But you got to learn from his example. you got to learn from Jesus. you got to place yourself in his hands. Say, God, you know what? I try to do this thing my own for a while. I've made you Savior. I, you've cleansed me of my sins. But I've been doing my own thing. I've been doing my own thing for a while. But you know what, God? Tonight's tonight. Tonight, enough is enough. Is enough. At the cross, I'm starting at that line. I'm going to start my race. Because if you look like the plain old block that I placed, if, if you guys have ever seen Pinewood Derby, try to put that, that block down the race, it's not even going to reach the finish line. It's going to stop. I actually tried it. <laughs> I think I did it during my, during my devotion. Put it on the track. Didn't even make it to the finish line. But if you allow God to take you through the process, take you through the transformation, there was tons of cars that not only crossed the line, but flew by, soared through. But if, if you notice, there were some cars that had a little bit of extra attention, that the, they allowed the, the creation to be worked on a little bit extra a little bit more. They were allowing it to cut off some even more weight, all these different things. They allowed it to go through a little bit of a longer process. And those are the cars that were flying through. Those are the cars that beat it. Let's be those kind of cars. Let's be the kind of people that achieve greatness. Because we've been in the presence of greatness. Because we've allowed God, we've said in our hearts, God, you are the great one. But we can rest a little bit easier knowing that we're being held hands of power, the hands of greatness. We're being held in the hands that bore the stars for you. Let's be more like Jesus. Because that's the only way we're going to change the world. What I want to do today, just like just like the first part of the verse said, arise and go now. I want to encourage you tonight. If you want to achieve greatness, you're going to have to say, you know what, God? I will arise. I will be the teenager. I may be young. I may be inexperienced, but I'm going to stand up in my generation. I'm going to arise, and I'm going to go down to my knees, and I'm going to say, Jesus, I'm in your hands. It's not about me anymore. It's about you changing me so that I can change the world. That's what I want to ask you. If that's you, would you even have a physical response by arising out of your seat and saying, you know what? I'm going to go down to the altar because that's where the potter's hands are. This is a metaphoral, metaphoric, symbolic by you just deciding that right now I'm going to get out of my seat I'm going to go down to the altar and I'm going to, I'm going to pray a prayer that sounds something like this God I'm in your hands God I place myself in your hands would you change me would you first change me and then would you use me so if that's you I'm not even going to close a prayer but I want to spend a few minutes I'm just letting you guys say you know what God I'm going to change the world but if I want to change the world first I've got to let you change me so if that's you arise and go down